please join me in welcoming Reverend Dr. Chavis and Provost Gallimore. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, How are you doing? I'm good, my man. You doing all right? It's great to see a brother like you in this place. Hey, man. that's what I was thinking. <laughs> so I was thinking. Uh, given, given everything that's going on in academics from the East Coast to the West Coast, I was telling President Price earlier, Duke seems to be at a better place uh, when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's not perfect, but it's at a better place. Mm -hmm. And when I learned you were the provost, I said, oh, man, I got to go back to Duke. <laughs> so I'm glad to be here. And, and Look, I know this is a fireside chat. We got the fire up here, but I'm ready to get right into it. All right, that sounds great. Well, um, people like us would not be here without all the things you've done to blaze the trail for us. So I want to acknowledge you and say how much I appreciate everything you've done to make it possible for me to sit in this chair. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm really thrilled and honored to officially welcome you to Duke University as our inaugural Environmental Justice and Racial Equity Fellow. Uh, when two of our uh, Vice Provosts, uh, Provost uh, Watt Smith, who you just heard from, and Vice Provost Abbas Ben Moonman, who uh, came to me uh, with this idea uh, for you to bring with us for a year or so, I was just super excited about this for a variety of reasons. Um, there really isn't anyone I could think of who would be in a better position to bridge our university's intellectual uh, priorities, but more importantly, in a way that acknowledges what we're trying to do and are doing in the notion of addressing uh, racism and inequality in general in the context of the climate crisis as well. And so um, it's really an honor to sit here. And before I get started, if I may, happy birthday. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so why don't we get to it, the first question. Um, so let me provide a little background. You know, as you look across this uh, room, you see uh, a diverse reflection of our community. And academia is really one of the few institutions where this type of diversity can exist in a community, if you will. And it's our job to harness that diversity to tackle the tough problems that face uh, our society. It's a place where we achieve remarkable feats of exploration, discovery, teaching, and learning. And yet, as you noted before, we have seen increasing opposition to our work and what we stand for from the outside. Uh, we're also seeing a rise in tribalism and anti-intellectualism around the world, especially in this country. So my first question is, you know, what do you think is the origin of these sentiments and what advice do you give us, members of the Duke University community, of addressing them? Well, thank you, Dr. Gallimard. And first, it's good to be back home at Duke. I um, worked on my Masters of Divinity here in the 1970s while I was still in prison unjustly with the Wilmington tent. Uh, the prison van would park me in front of the uh, Duke Chapel every day. I would get out attend some great class, but then the prison bus would come back and pick me up and take me back to Hillsborough Prison. The Wilmington Town was sentenced to 282 years in prison unjustly. And uh, we finally overturned those unjust convictions. And uh, I'm still involved in the movement. But let me just answer your question. I think the points that you reference are exemplary of something that's much deeper. I think uh, not just the United States, but particularly the United States, the rise of racism, the rise of anti-Semitism, the rise of hatred, the rise of anti-intellectualism mm -hmm. uh, have a deep root. And I think that um, I'm so pleased to spend time with Dr. J. Pearson, who uh, 
co-convenes a class here at Duke uh, University 101, Race and Racism in America. Mm -hmm. But we find that it's just not in America, it's all over the world. Yes, yes sir. I know you're originally from Jamaica. Mm -hmm. You're a yardic. <laughs> People, they don't know what yeah. that, that means. That's, you got to be from Jamaica to know what that means. <laughs> Michael Manley and I were very close friends. Oh. Yeah. What, what you found out in the freedom struggle, it is not as large as you may think. So I knew Michael Manley. I knew Nelson Mandela. Mm -hmm. I even knew Fidel Castro. I better whisper that. But um, I'm glad to see the former governor of uh, North Carolina here, Pat McCurry. He and I have become uh, close friends, colleagues, working together. He's a Republican. I'm a Democrat. Yep. Now, why am I bringing all this up? Mm -hmm. Because at the heart, I believe the problem is the denial of the oneness of all of our humanity. We're all part of one human family. If you ask what race are you, you're part of the human race. If you say you're something else, you're part of a concoction. You're part of a deliberate attempt to characterize people in hierarchies in order to justify the economic exploitation and oppression of those people. That's right. So I don't know if I answered the question. That's a great answer. <laughs> I mean, race was a conco an economic concoction yes. in this US to allow the United States to essentially enslave a group of people and come up with a pecking order exactly. for the economic benefit of a minority. Exactly. So, um, I have a colleague here, Stacey Brown, we're writing a book about the transatlantic slave trade. Mm -hmm. And even before 1619, before a few slaves, a few enslaved people arrived in uh, Virginia, the translated slave trade had been operative for over 100 years, even before 1619. And so this is an international, global um, expression of greed, expression of uh, characterizing and justifying the inhumanity to dehumanize uh, people based on characteristics but as you said, for economic gain. Mm -hmm. I think we've learned a lot. I, I do want to say at the beginning, I want to just pause a moment and give a prayer out to the King family. Yeah. Martin Luther King Jr., his latest, his um, youngest son passed today. Yeah. Dexter um, had a bout with cancer. I got very close to the King family. You know, I, at the age of 14, I was a youth organizer for Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, some of the best times of my life. Even when I was in high school and went to college, mm -hmm. I learned something about not only fighting for freedom, but about understanding why we fight for freedom. Understanding why we fight for equality. Understanding why there's a demand for equity. It's the whole history of a long, long travail to try to correct uh, the world's original sin, not just America's original sin. Uh, my great, 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 great grandfather was the Reverend John Chavis, uh, fought in the Revolutionary War. Mm. A lot of yeah. people of African Americans, of African descent, fought in them, but when it came time to have the uh, convention in Philadelphia, they couldn't go, even though they fought against the British. And they were landowners, by the way. Uh, here on this great campus of Duke University, I'm reminded of the land holdings uh, in North Carolina. Uh, I'm from Granville County, just about 30 miles from here. Mm -hmm. Once upon a time, Granville County, Durham County, all part of uh, massive plantations, but also part of giving, I think, uh, uh, an understanding that we need each other. Now, I don't want to be like Nikki Hill. I'm not talking about that we need slavery. Yeah. But what I'm talking about is that we find out in the world that we, in which we live in, not only in this nation, that we all really need each other. But education is so important. Mm -hmm. 
Carl G. Wilson wrote this book, The Miseducation of the Negro. It could have been expanded to the miseducation of Americans. Well. And institutions like Duke are trying to overcome mm -hmm. that miseducation, miseducation, overcome those prejudices. I don't think anyone is born a racist. Mm -hmm. I think they become racist because of miseducation, because of missocialization. And the base of racism is really ignorance. We don't know each other. You know, so I salute Duke for the work that you were embarked upon uh, on diversity, equity, and uh, inclusion. I've talked to President Price about how that also intersects with climate, because mm -hmm. climate is uh, not something far out. And I know you're a rocket scientist, <laughs> but you know. Uh, Climate change impinges upon the quality of life mm -hmm. of all people, but particularly in countries that emit so much carbon that it chokes the future of the rest of the world. Yeah. Yeah, I actually went into this rocket science business because I wanted to give humanity options like Mars, but we'll see okay, well, if we won't need The only that. thing is, when they, <laughs> you know, I, I have a friend at, uh, up at MIT. Yeah. The Chinese now are working on building a colony mm -hmm. uh, for Mars. And I was saying, damn, I hope they don't colonize Mars like they colonize the Earth. Well, right. you know, we have to be careful right. that we don't extract some of the basic yeah. ignorance yeah. and put it out That's right. in the uh, intergalactic right. uh, stratosphere. That's right. We don't want to export our bad habits, habits to other parts of the solar system, that's for sure. I mean, um, we talked about the importance of education and so on, and you've spent your entire life engaging with politics. You work with civil rights as an activist, of course. And as, as was illustrated, um, you've worked across the aisle to foster bipartisanship. Uh, President um, Ronald Daniels of Johns Hopkins recently published a book mm -hmm. called What Universities Owe Democracy, which seems relevant to the things we're talking about right now. So sort of digging a little deeper, and not just about Duke, although using Duke as, as an illustration, but more broadly, you know, this challenging time when higher education seems to be under assault, you know, what do you think higher education role should we play in upholding protecting our democratic system? Uh, three things. One. The, the academy, uh, colleges, universities like Duke University cannot afford to be silent in this debate. Mm -hmm. We have to be very outspoken. Um, number two, whenever you call up from the Congress of the United States, we should be posing the questions to them rather than to be the recipients of their venom. What I mean by that? Mm -hmm. We don't give an adequate funding to higher education in America. That's right. Higher education is still privileged. It's segregated. Uh, and it does not afford, um, I believe, the best opportunities uh, for the majority of the people. And so to me, a university like Duke not only has an obligation to its students, to its faculty, to the administration, but also to the community around. Uh, Duke University, and I understand that the climate yes, plan does that, in fact. Yes, That's great. Then the last thing I would say, uh, Brother Provost, is that we need a movement, a diverse, um, a multiracial, if I could use the term racial there, multicultural, multilingual movement for change that the university cannot just be, uh, you know, we go up in the ivory towers and observe what the people are doing. One of the things you'll learn from Latin American liberation theology is that academics have to also be engaged in proxies, has to also be engaged in the work and the study of liberation. But I, I, I travel out through airports, and I know you do too, I used to see all these books 
And I'm wondering, so I read the titles of the books. It's a lot of fluff. Yeah. Not much substance. Mm -hmm. So we need to encourage more um, scholarship mm -hmm. on these subject matters. Mm -hmm. We need to encourage the publication and distribution of uh, accurate data uh, about these phenomena. And then lastly, I think we need to work more on pre-K to 12 before you get to college. In New York State right now, the statistic of the passage or the failure of the third grade reading test yeah. is used to determine how many juvenile prisons they're going to build. Yeah. Yep. Because they know if you're not reading in grade level by the third grade, yeah, the odds are against you making it. The odds are formidable that you're going to wind up being incarcerated, even as a juvenile. So to me, yes, it's just not what happens when you are fortunate enough to get to a school like Duke, but it's what happens before you get here. Yeah. You know, we need a, not just a feeder system, we need to have a, a relationship where the education of every person in our country uh, it is, is an obligation. You know, I'm, I'm from the civil rights movement. We talk about rights. Mm -hmm. But with every right comes responsibility. And I think the more we become educated, the more we have to educate. Mm -hmm. The more we learn, the more we have to share. You know, that's what I believe. I think you, you alluded to, if I understand correctly, the hearings that happened in December. You have to, because it's been used so universally to kind of put down the academy. It wasn't just Harvard. No, or, it wasn't. Or, you know, but you have to understand that in our society, we always look for uh, the boogie bear. Yeah. Somebody to point to. Yeah. Somebody to say, aha, you're the reason why society is uh, all fractured. And usually, the finger pointer is the one actually doing the fraction, but that's a whole nother story. Where, where did that venom come from? I mean, I was just struck by the intensity of the questioning, and maybe even I was more struck by the lack of support for the presidents afterwards, the silence, the deafening silence. Well, I'm going to give you a broad answer. Yeah. I think our society is working at the extremes, the extreme right and the extreme left, and people in the middle are losing ground. Um, the fact that we could be sitting here now in January, and it looks like in November of this year, there's a possibility, mm -hmm. there's a probability mm -hmm. that Donald Trump will be reelected or be elected. I don't, that's not going to bode well for the academy. I don't think it's going to bode well for communities. So we got to do something about it. So to me, what we witness sometimes in Congress is the absence of bipartisanship, the absence of civility, the absence of um, just mutual respect. Mm -hmm. Even if you have a point where we disagree, we don't have to do it in a way where I, where I demean you, where I take away your, your own purpose of life. Yeah. You know? So yes, that, that hatred you know, cuts across um, social and economic lines, and it cuts across the ADR. This is the point I'm trying to make, mm -hmm. is that we seem to be not just tolerant of uh, hatred, but it's an embrace of it, yeah. you know? Uh, like we haven't learned anything from the Civil War days. No. You know, uh, so, but, I, but look, I didn't come tonight to be a pessimist. One of the only reasons why I'm so glad to be back at Duke, I think we can change this stuff. You know, when people see Governor McCoy and I together, they say, oh my God, <laughs> I can, uh, like a Republican governor. <laughs> and some of the people here now are saying, oh my God, how did this happen? <laughs> because we work at it. You know, nothing happens by osmosis. You're yeah. fine. Nothing. You have to work at it. Yeah. And if we work at pushing forward the principles of equality, 
the demand for equal justice, equity, respect for the environment. Uh, we got a lot to do. I mean, when we talk about environmental injustice, mm -hmm. environmental racism, we have a lot to do. And the clock mm -hmm. of time, yeah. you know, it's not like we can just wait around for another 100 years to work on some of these issues. There's a sense of urgency. And uh, that's why I'm thankful to have an opportunity to teach, but I also learn from my students. Um, a study has shown that young people today are not as prejudiced as their parents or grandparents. But also, young people today are susceptible yeah. to a lot of the things that are not accurate on social media. So I'm very concerned about that. Uh, all the information out there is not accurate. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is uh, deliberately, I would call it disinformation mm -hmm. rather than information. And unfortunately, even in politics, people do things to make sure that they have a lot of media impressions. Yes. Rather than to make sure what they're saying is anchored in some reality or in particular something that would help others in a less fortunate situation. Yeah. You know, given the things you've experienced, um, the myriad of injustices in your life to you and to others, people you care about, you've seen the uglier side in society, but you've also committed yourself to the life of the mind, which is one of the reasons you're here at Duke, and we're so fortunate to have you. How do you remain optimistic? How, and how do you convey to people why you should be optimistic? Which I am too, but I'd love to hear from your perspective why you're optimistic. Well, I think, you know, I'm, I'm also a religious guy. Mm -hmm. I think God answers prayers. I don't think God just hears the prayers. The prayers will be answered. But we have to be the vessels to which the prayer is answered. Um, so my optimism is that I don't think the creator, for whatever name you want to call the creator, mm -hmm. has created this wonderful cosmos, this wonderful world for us to destroy it. I mean, we have reason to try to protect the environment, the climate. But back in the, uh, I'm smiling because back in the 1980s, when I got involved in the environmental movement, it was all white. Yeah. People were hugging trees, but not hugging people. Yeah. yeah. And in Warren County, governor found out that, this is Governor Hunt, it wasn't you. Somebody from the Northeast had dumped polychlorinated biphenyls, mm -hmm. PCBs. And you know, that comes from transformers. Yeah. Electrical transformers. Mm -hmm. So when they discarded these electrical transformers, they needed to do something with the waste, uh, liquefied PCBs. So some tanker trucks came from up, uh, I think, Connecticut or Massachusetts or somewhere, and dumped it on the highways here in uh, North Carolina. So rightly, the governor knew this stuff was toxic. Now you have toxic-laden soil, yeah. not just a liquid. And uh, so they ordered it scraped up. So now we have truckloads, hundreds of truckloads of polychlorinated, carcinogenic, cancer-causing substance. There are 100 counties in North Carolina. The most predominant black county is Warren County. And one of the most agricultural Rural counties is Warren County. Everybody, it was no kind of running water. Everybody had well water. So the last place, yeah. Dr. Gallimore, you want to dig a hole, call it a landfill, and then dump all these tons of uh, polychlorinated biphenyls. So after the Wilmington 10, after graduating from here in 1980, the last thing I want to do is get arrested again in North Carolina. But in 1982, when we found out that they were going to uh, 
in fact, yeah. not only dig the hole, they dug the hole. They were, they were with the trucks headed to the hole. So uh, you say, well, am I optimistic? Well, because I know the power when people organize, when women and children, and some men, but it was mainly women and children, laid down in the street in front of the trucks. Wow, there it is. I was arrested. And in the Warren County Jail that night, I came up uh, with this idea. Actually, I defined environmental racism in the Warren County Jail. Mm -hmm. Now, the uh, law schools, including this law school, everybody rightly has courses now on environmental justice, environmental racism. And one of the things I was thinking about in the Warren County Jail was not just me trying to get out, but I was thinking about those heroic women and children whose names will never yeah. get recorded in history. Yeah. But I want to make sure that the Warren County struggle what started there, now it's just not a national, it's all over the world. Mm -hmm. Every time they had a COP conference, they talk about Warren County. So what does that mean? That when you struggle, you just don't struggle for yourself in a narrow way. You struggle for all people in one community. And what you find out is that if you win a victory one place, if you do it, it, has, it impedes the opportunity for other places. And the truth of the matter is, and even though I'm in the media now with the national black press, I don't think any media covers the good news. Yeah. We cover the bad news. Yeah. We yeah. cover the failures. We cover the yeah. corruption. Not that that shouldn't be covered. Yeah, but, but believe me, there's much more good news out here than the world will ever know about because we don't talk about the good news. That doesn't excite us. That doesn't stimulate us. But that's where I get my stimulation from. I love to see brothers and sisters smile after they didn't want something, you know? And we won a lot. Mm -hmm. so pay the price, like voting. This is 2024, and we should never allow uh, voter suppression or any tactic. I know my dear sister's here from the state legislature. You have to pray for the North Carolina legislature. They're always trying to find ways out to jury man mm -hmm. and to, uh, in my view, I think this is a great state. I'm, I love my state, but also don't think we've reached our true, uh, true potential. So uh, my optimism is uh, interdisciplinary. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just in one, because I don't think any one discipline is going to uh, help us to overcome. Yeah. Last point. Yeah. When we used to say we shall overcome back in the 1960s, we were not overcoming, but we sang the song anyway because we believed that if we kept singing, kept marching, kept demonstrating, kept sacrificing, we would overcome. And the 1964 Civil Rights Act, when Johnson... President Johnson would not have been able to sign that Civil Rights Act if it wasn't for Senator Everett Dirksen, mm -hmm. a Republican. Mm -hmm. The Civil Rights Bill was a bipartisan bill. A year later, 1965, the Voting Rights Act it was mm -hmm. a bipartisan. 1968, the Fair Housing Act, bipartisan. Why am I bringing this up? Because we wonder why nothing gets done in the Congress of the United States today, because we, we're not bipartisan. You got people who actually hate each other because they're in a different party. I think that's a sad commentary on where we are. But what will it take, let's say 20 years from now, if we're in a place where bipartisanship works, people can disagree without being disagreeable, and we can make real progress, progress we need to make. Yeah. What will it take between now and then to get there in your estimation? In my estimation, we've got to start this year. 2024 is so pivotal. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say this. I don't want to say anything too radical, but if we don't take care of the business in 2024, we may not be here 20 years from now. Because you let up with the wrong people to be starting nuclear wars and even contemplating, you know, 
uh, uh, not only destructions of others, but even self-destruction out of some warped understanding of uh, their place in the world. And, you know, so I think there's a sense of urgency over the next 20 years, one, to get as many people in the world, not in America, educated. Education is the key to liberation. In the classroom, and education is not only in the classroom, it's in the community, mm -hmm. it's in the home. When I first started teaching, I used to ask my students, what kind of books you reading at the home? Yeah. And I, I, mm -hmm. I'm not embarrassed to tell you, some of my students told me there were no books in the home. Mm -hmm. They had the Bible, and the Bible is a good book. But the Bible alone is not sufficient to get you intellectually developed. Yeah. And you young people, they watch what their parents do. They watch what their grandparents do. You don't see mama or daddy or grandparents or aunt or uncle reading a newspaper, a book, a magazine. I, I'm all, most of the African Americans, I'll tell you, you know, you would get in trouble if you didn't have Jet Magazine or Ebony Magazine. <laughs> and then you would save, and then you'd make everybody in the family make sure that they read it. <laughs> we need to return to that. Yeah. This thirst, this hunger for truth. The thirst and the hunger for right-sizing what has been wrong-sized. And then, over the next 20 years, I think we have to learn from our history. Mm -hmm. I don't think we really learned enough from January the 6th. Mm -hmm. That's why people are in denial. Mm -hmm. I, I have an apartment mm -hmm. on, um, well, I shouldn't give out my address, well, <laughs> I, on Pennsylvania Avenue. Yeah. So on January the 6th, I was standing on the bathroom watching this group of people march. I didn't know where they were coming from. I assumed they were coming from the Ellipse, the White House. But these people were so angry. Oof. I'm talking before they got to the Capitol. They were tearing down signs. They were, if somebody had a Black Lives Matter uh, uh, silhouette in that one, they broke the windows. They attacked church. So what in the world is going on? So it wasn't just. What they did at the Capitol is what they did on the way to the Capitol. These people were enraged. Now, I don't, I, listen. It's indicative of what we did not learn in 1898 in Wilmington, North Carolina, when there was a race massacre in this state. Why? because blacks and Republicans had called something called fusion government. And I, even though I'm a Democrat, I hate to admit it, it was the Democrats that attacked them. Oh, yeah. Massacred them. Using the press, the people who owned, the Daniels who owned the News and Observer newspaper, they were putting cartoons, caricatures of, of, of black people, uh, particular black men raping white women. That's That's... So we don't, we don't, you know, history repeats itself yes. Yes. if we don't study and understand. To me, I don't want to repeat itself, but I want to extract learnings from it. You know, time does not permit in the, in the hour that we have for me to just, I could give you a whole chronology, you know, from the 1700s up to now, where, and even the Supreme Court decisions uh, have not been tilted, in my view, in the right way. Dr. King used to say that the um, arc of justice uh, is bent toward, you know, equality and justice. The arc of history is bent toward. But somebody's got to bend the arc. Yeah. The arc is not, the arc doesn't bend itself. And so in the next 20 years, we've got to bend the arc some more. You know. I love that. Bend the arc. Lifelong learning. I want to talk a little bit about, I mean, you're here, you had many options to be anywhere else, and you're part of your fellowship year here at Duke, which we're so grateful for, and you'll be te you're teaching a course, actually, with Dr. Jay Pearson in the Sanford School of Public Policy. Well, just let me say, it's, it's, it sure oh, yeah. feels good to come to Duke without handcuffs. <laughs> 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 huh. 
Well, we can do a lot better than that. <laughs> so that's good. But um, I, in fact, some of your students may be in, in, in the course, um, the lived experience of race and racism might be here, yes. right here. And my um, first question about that is, may I audit your course? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Well, Jay, I, we'll be honored you can audit the course. In fact, it's a university-wide yeah. course, uh, undergraduate as well as graduate. I mean, look, hmm. come on in. Come on in. All right, good. But all kidding aside, and I'm only half joking about this, um, what advice would you give the people in the audience in terms of um, lifelong learning and sort of navigating the notion of reinvention? Because, I mean, you've had so many experiences from um, many disciplines, chemistry, theology, business, music, you know, run DMC and everything like that and more. So you've been able, you're sort I'm of- I'm a hip hop head. Yeah, you're a Renaissance person, without a doubt. OG. AG. <laughs> 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 but how do, you, how do you do that? How, where's that youthful vitality and that interest in, well, in reinvention come from? Thank you for wishing me a happy birthday today. I'm, I'm 76. Uh, I'm blessed. I was blessed to be brought up in a home. Uh, my parents, church goers, goers, therefore I had to go because they were in church. So I learned a lot about um, education. Um, I went to elementary school, the Angie B. Duke hmm. Elementary School in really? Oxford, North Carolina. Wow. Wow. Named after the Duke family. Yeah. Wow. But the Angie B. Duke Elementary School is on the campus of the North Carolina Colored Orphanage. Hmm. There were two orphanages in Oxford, one for whites, one for colors. And the difference between the two was like night and day. The white orphanage looked like a college campus, a school of printing, a school of this, for high schools. The colored orphanage, mm. belly head shoes. One reason why my size, I wear size 12 is because the orphans didn't have shoes uh, six months out of the year. So there's no way in the world I was going to go to school with shoes, and they didn't have no shoes. Uh, my mother taught at the school for 40 years, sixth grade. Mm. And um, I learned not something just about empathy, but to me, solidarity is an experience. It's not something external. You, you, you have to internalize not just what you're feeling, but what others are feeling. And if you do that, I think we'd be much more sensitive. Like right now, there are parts of the country that are disproportionately exposed to environmental hazards. Look at Flint, Michigan. Yeah, yep. You know the people in Flint, exactly. Michigan, yep. are, uh, there's no detoxification of lead poisoning once it gets into your lymph system. Mm -hmm. So these brothers and sisters in Flint, Michigan have to live the rest of their lives. Yes. From lead and poisons in the public water system. And yet, there's still a debate about whether or not it should get any kind of reparation. You know, I, I just think it's awful. But I do think we have to learn from that. I'm gonna go back to about learning from history, extracting, and also planning ahead. I think we have to plan for a better future. Uh, uh, Mandela used to tell me, because a lot of people thought when he got out of prison, there was going to be a race war yeah. in South Africa. Yeah, right. But Mandela knew better. He'd been in prison for 27 years, and he studied that situation. And he knew that for South Africa to have a greater promise, yes, apartheid has to be dismantled. But apartheid also has to be dismantled in the consciousness of people. So we have made progress. Uh, racial progress in America, but we still haven't really, in my view, uh, desegregated our minds, desegregated our consciousness. I think it's possible, uh, but I think it's, it comes as a result of working at it. I think it comes as a result of uh, identifying and sharing the blessings and the victories when people do come together and make a difference. And then let me say something about the young people today. Yeah. I think the youth today are the best generation 
the most intelligent generation, the most gifted, and the most talented. However, they also received the most discouragement. Mm. I never knew you could be expelled from pre-K. We got some young brothers and sisters in some of these cities, Dr. Gallimah, who get a jacket on them even before they get to the first grade. When I mean a jacket, it follows their academic yeah. career. You know, you are hypertensive. Yeah. You are yeah. restless in class. Some of it because maybe they didn't have breakfast that morning. Mm -hmm. And now they want to take away nutrition out of schools. So some of this stuff is, in my view, one reason why I say um, interdisciplinary, because that's my life. I'm finding out how things are connected. Mm -hmm. And to me, the more we find out how things are connected, we can f find a way how to shape the future, how to shape a better future. Um, and that's, that's what feeds my optimism. Um, what advice do you have for young people? Learn all you can. Don't ever put a period on your education. Don't ever, you can have a semicolon, but not a period. You can have a comma, but not a period. It's continuing education. In the classroom, in the community. I would also say that traveling outside of the United States mm -hmm. is therapeutic. Because when you come back, you have a point of reference. I've seen people with much less than we have here do so much more. Yeah. We tend to underestimate, as Americans, not just black people, I'm talking about Americans, we tend to, we tend to underestimate how blessed this nation is. Oh, I'll be the first to say, there are a whole lot of things wrong. Absolutely. But there are also a whole lot of things right. Mm -hmm. And we don't talk about those enough. Mm -hmm. So my, I want to encourage young people uh, to strive for excellence while they are young. Don't go for the okie doke Don't go for the myth, well, I'm going to do well, you know, uh, after I stack some paper. Yeah. Not, that's not happening. You know, you have to really, uh, in my view, strive I, I like to see young brothers and sisters striving in the first grade, second grade, third grade. So when they take the third grade reading test, they knock it out the park, you know. And not that the test is the test. Yeah. It's more we do so much to uh, disqualify young people rather than to qualify them, you know. So part of what uh, Dr. Pierce and I are going to do with the course is certainly teach but also we're going to encourage. Yeah. So that leads into my next question, which is for those of us who are not so young, what advice do you have for us? Not only in terms of how do we support our younger brothers and sisters, but how do we bend the arc to get to that prosperous 20 years that we're looking for from now? That's, that's a very good question. Um, There's one thing I've learned among many things, but one thing. I don't think that the creator mm -hmm. only deposited the ability to be intelligent in one place mm -hmm. or one geography or one people. So to me, those of us who are over 50, over 60, over 70, over 40. You have to be careful how you say who's, eight, who's old. Uh, I think we should all have, we should be mentors. Yeah. We should be uh, encouragers. Yeah. We should also, I think, kind of step back. Really, the movement needs to be intergenerational. Mm -hmm. I don't think that parsing out, well, the elders are going to do this, the young people are going to do this, middle-aged people are going to do this. I think it is much more vibrant 
has much more vitality if we build things from an intergenerational perspective. Because I, I, in my age, I learn from young people still oh, yeah. today. Oh, yeah. And I hope they can learn a little something from me. But it's the exchange of what we learn. I'm not anti-science. I think science is uh, important. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's how science is used. Yes, absolutely. Because keep in mind, you know, centuries ago, people thought the concept of race was scientific. Mm -hmm. Now our great biologists, our great geneticists, in case you all don't know it, we're all African up in here. Mm -hmm. We all have the same mm -hmm. genetic construction. So if we all have the same genetic, if, I mean, if, if everybody's yeah. just, then why do we develop these mm -hmm. prejudices and things that, where we don't see in one another ourselves? And so, I think, uh, to answer your question, the role of what we call elders mm -hmm. is to uh, be a mentor, to teach, but above all, to have this intergenerational experience. Because in most places, the elders t tend to talk to the elders. Yeah, that's right. The youth tend to talk to the youth. There's very little, I, you know, I'm, because of my job, I'm an observer on social media. Uh, most people our age are not into TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> I guess we're still in the Facebook generation. <laughs> Maybe LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah. But young people, they, you know, they're into it. Yeah. Uh, rightly so. I, I don't think we should force young people to do what we did or what's for us. I think we need to learn vice versa. But there's also points, though, no matter what your age, mm -hmm. you should never try to demean another human being Yeah. Yes. because of your perceived race, mm -hmm. your perceived ethnicity, mm -hmm. your perceived religion, mm -hmm. your perceived sexual orientation, your perceived whatever other category people try to uh, put people in. I think uh, th those are disincentives. Uh, and actually, when you hold somebody else back, you hold yourself back. Absolutely. I mean, it's so easy, I think, and what I've seen is one generation will dismiss another one, almost like it's fiat, that it's passed down to the elders, that somehow when you get to a certain age, you, you view young people in a certain way. Right. I'm, I'm going to give you an example. Yeah. After the George Floyd murder, mm -hmm. there was so many brothers and sisters marching in the street, but they weren't marching alone. Mm -hmm. It was some of the most racially diverse demonstrations that our nation's ever seen. So I had meetings with the BLM, the Black Lives Matter movement. Because I wanted to help them. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of them said, well, Dr. Chavis, look, we ain't trying to do what y'all did in the 1960s. We're trying to do something else. I said, I want you to do something else, but I want you to learn yeah. from the something that we did. Mm -hmm. And they were opposed to um, structure. And I said, well, how are you going to have a movement without structure? How are you going to have a movement without leaders? You know, maybe they discover something <laughs> that I don't know. Another way. But today, the Black Lives Matter movement is fractured yeah. because of that reason today. Yeah. It had one of the greatest potentials yeah. to transform. And I'm not putting Black Lives Matter movement mm -hmm. down. I'm just giving you an example of not learning from history yeah. and thinking that being young in and of itself gives you the license to ignore centuries of human history. 
sort of related to that, and maybe this is the last question, hip-hop. That is uh, maybe the quintessential musical genre that people of one generation dismiss. Right. You've embraced it. Why? Well, I see Charles Stevenson somewhere out here in the audience. He's a hip-hop head. He's a little old guy now. And I know Dr. Neal is up in here from the African American Studies Program. But let's let me say, hip-hop is a cultural phenomenon, 50 years old. It's probably a little older than that, but people say it's 50 now. Started in the South Bronx among blacks and Latinos. And I don't know if you knew the characteristics of the South Bronx 50 years ago. It's pretty poor, pretty devastating. Uh, but the young people decided that their poetry, that their dance, that their art forms, we call it graffiti, but it was art form, could be representative not just of the anger, but of the passion for a better life. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I have to show you, I have, there's a videotape of, uh, I went on Oprah Winfrey's show, mm -hmm. and she was upset with hip hop. And I know some of y'all may be upset with hip hop. Uh, a, a shock jock in New York, mm -hmm. a white shock jock, had called the uh, New Jersey women's basketball team uh, a I group know. of nappy-headed oh, hoes. Yeah, I remember. Yep. Terrible. Yep, I remember. So the shock jock said, well, I said that because rappers refer to those terms. So Russell Simmons, myself, Carmen, the artist, and Kevin Lyles, we on Oprah's show, and she has a whole group of sisters from Spelman College in the uh, audience. I open knows how to set the stage. <laughs> <laughs> so I, to, you know, my colleagues were a little nervous. But Oprah said, what are you going to do about this language? What are you going to do about this profanity? And I said, Oprah, I'm glad you asked that question. Because if you want these rappers not to use profanity, not to use derogatory terms, then help us get rid of the profanity of poverty. Help us get rid of the profanity of the social condition that the rappers describe in their music, in their lyrics, in their video. That's what they want to change. But you can't change what you don't put forth in your consciousness. So hip-hop now is a global phenomenon. Mm -hmm. I went to China and Hong Kong. I saw some Asian brothers and sisters with dreadlocks doing the one and twos like they were from Harlem. <laughs> <laughs> because hip-hop has transcended this notion of race. It's transcended this notion of why we should not find ways to work together. I know when Eminem first started rapping, people said, man, how can this white rapper from Detroit talk about hip hop? He evolved to one of the best. Mm -hmm. Eight Mile. Eight Mile. Mm -hmm. so, but, so that shows you that, and then I want to say that my Latino brothers and sisters in, in hip hop, in South Africa, hip hop is called Kwaito, but it's, it's hip hop. Uh, they said that music is the universal language. But I think I would love to see a, a global movement of young people. Most of the environmental group is led by women in Africa and Asia and other parts of the world. I find that very encouraging. I find that very, very encouraging. And I guess the only thing that I, I should have said when you asked the question is what should we do? I'm going to encourage everybody to learn an additional language other than English. Hmm. English is a great language. We're speaking it, but it ain't the only language. And when you know more than one language, mm -hmm. it also opens your mindset up uh, to other 
social and intellectual phenomena that may not be codified in the English language. Yes, yes. Well, I think it's obvious to everyone why we're so fortunate to have you come back to the Duke. Well, thank you. I'm just so glad y'all welcome me. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you.